had the honor of having Dean and Anne, his wife, on um, for literally, it was the, the first, first the first time right. to talk about their, their, their book, Undo It, and uh, we were, were excited that we were the, the, the first um, the live interview, That's right. the day it came out, and since then, I know you've been on Oprah and on Ellen and Dr. Oz and cool probably a whole... Oh, thank you. <laughs> a whole a host of, of, uh, of other shows to talk about it. National bestseller. Yep. Um, can you, so in the book, and I'm, I want to get right to the sort of the, the, the bread and the heart of the book, the bread and the butter is... I didn't say the meat of it, but anyway. The meat of the... I, know, I wouldn't say meat around you. <laughs> um, so the... Right, the bread and butter. Hey, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was almond butter, so it was okay. <laughs> um, so in the book, you put forth... Um, this theory, this unifying theory um, about disease, chronic disease. Can you share with us a little bit about what that means? Sure. Well, I was trained like all doctors, like you were, uh, to view heart disease and type 2 diabetes and hypertension and prostate cancer and perhaps even Alzheimer's as different diseases, different diagnoses and different treatments. But after over 40 years of doing research, we found that these same simple lifestyle changes, uh, a whole foods plant-based diet that's low in fat and sugar, moderate exercise like walking a half an hour a day, various stress management techniques including meditation and yoga, and uh, psychosocial support or love and intimacy, or to reduce it even further to eat well, move more, stress less, and love more, that these same lifestyle changes could reverse the progression of a wide variety of chronic diseases that at the time were thought impossible. And the more diseases we've studied and the more underlying mechanisms we look at, the more evidence we have to show that with all this interest in personalized medicine, I mean, if you're talking about a, a targeted immunotherapy for a particular line of pancreatic cancer or melanoma, it's awesome. But for the vast majority of chronic diseases, it's these same lifestyle changes that could reverse and therefore prevent all of them. And I think that what finally is like, well, why is that? You know, it's not like you have to do one kind of exercise for heart disease and a different one for diabetes and so on. It's just exercise. If you like it, you'll do it. And I wondered, why is that? And what I realized is that the reason why these same lifestyle changes can reverse and prevent so many different chronic diseases is I really think that they're the same disease manifesting and masquerading in different forms. <clears throat> and I say that because they all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome, in telomeres, in angiogenesis, in gene expression, in overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system and immune function and so on. And each one of these mechanisms in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get and how much love and support we have. Eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. And so it radically simplifies it for people. So. It's not like you have to say, gosh, today, you know, what should I be doing? It's really the same for everyone. It also helps explain what are called comorbidities. In other words, you'll often find that the same person will have heart disease and type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure and elevated cholesterol and be overweight. Or entire countries like China 50 years ago where they had almost none of these chronic diseases and so they start to eat like us and live like us and now all too often die like us. And so it makes it radically simple of what we tell our patients to do because, you know, it's the same for everyone. And the more you change, the more you improve. It's not all or nothing. To reverse disease, it takes a lot. To prevent it, the more you change, the more you improve. And you decide how much you want to change. Yeah. And for, to, just to, to step back for a second, although it seems like it's common sense, like, oh, you eat, eat well, you exercise more, uh, you're going to be healthier. The, truly, the, even the medical community, Dean really was the father of this idea that, um, that diet and exercise can truly change um, our health and wellness. And back when you started, I mean, it was, I'm going to get a little fly, um, it was, it was a, a profound um, discovery almost uh, where people were like, ah, it's not going to change it, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. And it was really your initial studies that sort of got the ball rolling and really got everybody on board with the fact that this really can be a health style and a healthy change to people. It's true. Um, I helped create a field called lifestyle medicine, which is using lifestyle changes not only to help prevent disease, which we all know, but to treat and often even reverse it, either in combination with drugs and surgery or often as an alternative to them. And when we started doing studies over 40 years ago, the idea that heart disease could be reversed was thought impossible, or type 2 diabetes or any of these conditions. 
And to me, the reason why I spend so much time doing uh, well-designed research studies is that the, the power of research is to redefine what's possible. And then by doing so, it can give many people new hope and new choices that they didn't have before. It, it, it's, it's amazing. So I was, as I was preparing for this, um, we were talking about some of the new studies, the new things that you're looking at. So we're moving beyond just general health and we're looking at chronic diseases, but you're now specifically looking at Alzheimer's disease too. Yes. Can, can you share a little bit about some of your new current studies? Sure. Well, you know, Alzheimer's, my mom died of Alzheimer's and it's, she was brilliant and just watching her brilliant mind um, decay was incredibly stressful for everyone. And when you lose your memories, you know, you lose everything. And Alzheimer's, unlike heart disease or diabetes, whether other drugs or stents or bypasses, whatever, there are really no effective drugs for reversing Alzheimer's. And they've, been, they've spent billions and billions of dollars looking for the blockbuster drug, but they, they haven't found it yet. And yet I think we're at a place with Alzheimer's very reminiscent of where we were with heart disease when we started doing studies there four decades ago. In other words, the mechanisms are the same that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the less intensive lifestyle interventions back then could slow the rate of heart disease building up plaque in your arteries. We found a more intensive intervention could actually reverse it. And similarly now, less intensive interventions of Alzheimer's disease, the, the finger study from Finland, the mind study and others have shown that you can slow the rate at which you get worse, but you're still getting worse just more slowly. And so I think it may be true, and this is what we want to find out, that we can may perhaps reverse it by making bigger changes in lifestyle. Now, we're in the middle of the study, so it's, we can't say anything for sure right now, but it's a randomized trial with 100 men and women who get the intervention from, for 20 weeks or 40 weeks, and then we compare them. And we're looking at changes not only in their cognitive function, but also in their telomeres, in their gene expression, in their proteomics, and their microbiome. It turns out that the, the uh, amyloid in your brain actually is produced mostly in your gut, and so it's, it, it's, it's a it's systemic illness. And so, um, and Alzheimer's is a profoundly isolating disease. And one of the things I'd like to, that we talked about earlier is that <clears throat> studies after study have shown that people who are isolated, lonely and depressed and isolated, which I think is the real epidemic in mm -hmm. our culture, are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely of virtually all causes when compared to those who have a sense of love and connection and community. <clears throat> and I think that's especially true in Alzheimer's, which is a profoundly isolating disease. What happens is, you know, suddenly it's like, what was that person's name? And where did I leave my keys? And next thing you know, you're, you don't want to go out because you don't want to embarrass yourself because you feel like you're not remembering things as well. Next thing you know, you're in front of the doctor and the doctor is saying, I'm sorry, you've got Alzheimer's disease and it's only going to get worse. Maybe we can help it get worse more slowly, but it's going to get worse. And by the way, we're taking away your driver's license. Yeah. And um, so your world shrinks even more. And then you just have this incredible like death sentence, like, oh my God, my, my brain is only going to get worse and worse. It's a little like the, it reminds me of the scene in 2001 where they start to pull the memory cores out of hell, the computer, and they start singing, you know, Daisy, Daisy as it goes. And so <clears throat> you get into this downward spiral where you think you're never going to get better and you kind of lose hope and you stop doing much and it just all becomes self-fulfilling. So if we show, and it's a big if, but if we show that we can reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's, then that will give millions of people new hope and new choices that they didn't have before. If we show that it does absolutely nothing, that'll be important for people to know as well so they don't delude themselves. But I'm cautiously optimistic and hoping that we'll, we'll be able to show that, but um, it's premature to say anything at this time about what the outcomes are. Well, I think that, like you said, with this unifying theory, that uh, I think it'd be very unlikely that it doesn't show some improvement. So when we, do, for your current study, um, you're looking at lifestyle changes, so it's not just diet and exercise. We were also talking about connections, yes. and that it's important to maintain and continue to develop connections, yes. because whether they're intimate or social, that they're actually helping and improve the synaptic connections, too. Yeah, I have this weird theory that, you know, I didn't know this until um, I started doing these studies, uh, the study on, on Alzheimer's, that except at the very end stages, those memories are still there in people with early Alzheimer's. They just lose the synaptic connections to them, which is an interesting metaphor. And so my kind of weird hypothesis is that if we can put people in a support group, which is one of the four elements of our program, and, and encourage them to form connections with each other, maybe, again, maybe, that will help them form connections with those memories. And so in our studies, you know, one guy might say, you know, I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and I, 
I lost my driver's license, and my wife left me, my dog died, and one of the other guys said, you know, I lost my driver's license too, but I got a bike, and let's go bike shopping together. Now they're out buying a bike together. Now their world expands, or they, you know, they, they, they have the sense of love and caring from each other. And so uh, it's a really powerful thing. You know, we tend to think of advances in medicine as something really high-tech and expensive, you know, a new drug, a new laser, you know, a new procedure, a new device. And yet I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. You know, people say, well, I get diet and I get exercise and I get, you know, stress management. But love and support, that's kind of weird. You know, what does that have to do with any of this stuff? And yet I think that both from the standpoint of motivating people to make lifestyle changes or even to take their medications, for example, I mean, telling somebody who's lonely and depressed and isolated that they're going to live longer if they just, you know, change their diet or take their meds doesn't really motivate most people. They're saying, you don't get it. I'm just trying to get through the day. You know, yeah. I, I, why would I want to live longer? I'm, I'm miserable. And, you know, again, study after study of showing that these behaviors are the most powerful determinant of not only our well-being, but even our survival. You know, three to ten times more likely to get sick and die prematurely if you're lonely and depressed. And over the last 50 years, there's been a radical shift in our culture with the breakdown of the social networks that used to give people that sense of love and connection and community. You know, 50 years ago, people had an extended family they saw. They had a church or synagogue or a mosque or whatever that they went to on a regular basis. They had a job that they'd been at for 10 or 20 years that felt secure. They had a, you know, a, a, uh, an extended family or a, uh, a neighborhood with two or three generations of people. And many people today don't have any of those. And as our country gets more tribalized and more polarized and the breakdown of these social networks, it's really, I think, creating a lot of despair. And, and there was a wonderful article by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times yesterday about this community that, uh, of kind of middle class, mostly white people, where the, the, the mortality rate is going up skyrocketing for the first time in, in, in decades because of the breakdown of these social networks. And so the time that we spend with our friends and family and our loved ones is not a luxury that we do after we've done all the important stuff. It turns out it may be the most important stuff. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought up um, communities because we, in what's going on in, 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 in our country and actually around the world, um, there is a, uh, a lot of um, isolation. There's yeah. a lot of uh, bad feelings and, and things like that. You mentioned that love, support, unity is all part of this. So yes. do you think that um, bringing, whether it's our country, the world, people together in general yes. actually helps with wellness and health? Well, studies have shown that it does. I mean, you know, London, England has a minister of loneliness now because they're recognizing this is such a Do big they really? issue. Really? I knew that. Um, I, I really think that anything that brings us together is healing. You know, the, even the word healing comes from the root to make whole, and yoga is from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, union. These are really old ideas that we're bringing together. Now, one way to feel a sense of community is to have a common enemy, and there's unfortunately a lot of that happening in the country now, this kind of tribalization. But it's really a false intimacy. And I, there was a wonderful interview that, uh, interview that George Lucas, you know, about the Star Wars movies, did with Bill Moyers um, uh, many years ago when the first Star Wars movie came, started coming out, talking about, you know, what is the whole meaning of Darth Vader and the Siths and all of that. And he was saying that if you have a, um, a community based on fear and anger, that invariably it becomes smaller and smaller because people start to, you know, kill each other off until finally you're just left with two. You know, you've got the emperor and then you've got Darth Vader and then one of them has to die. And so it, it's kind of the ultimate isolating experience. And yet all spiritual traditions really talk about love and compassion, what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy, you know, mm -hmm. love and compassion, forgiveness and, 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 and caring. Because not to get to heaven or to get good karma or some external goal, but what I've realized from studying with all these spiritual teachers and reading their works is that this is how you live a fun, healthy, productive, loving life. You know, that when you, you know, demonize someone as the other, you know, without making any particular reference, you know, those Mexican rapists, those uh, Muslim terrorists or whatever, as being fundamentally different from you and only different, <clears throat> that's when uh, suffering begins. That's when illness ultimately begins. Um, you know, when studies have shown that the one emotion that's, it's not type A behavior, it's not, you know, talking fast, it's if the people who have a lot of chronic anger and hostility, that's the one emotion that's most strongly linked with heart disease and heart attacks, among other conditions. And so when you forgive somebody, it doesn't excuse or condone what they've done, 
but it frees you from the suffering, you know, that, that carrying all that chronic anger. When you have that chronic anger, it makes your arteries constrict. It makes your blood clot faster. It makes the plaque build up faster in your arteries. It suppresses your immune function. It interferes with your mental function. And so <clears throat> when properly seen that on one level, yes, we are separate, but on another level, we're part of something larger that connects us all, whatever name you give to that. And even give it, to give it a name is to limit what's essentially a, a unity consciousness or um, a oneness experience, kind of like the projector you know, that's shining here. You know, there's, there's a light behind the projector. Then on the screen, you have all these names and forms that we can enjoy. But we can really only enjoy them if we also have that double vision and see the unity as well as the diversity. And then so things like love and compassion and forgiveness come naturally when you come from that place. There was a study that came out last year of, of um, 148 million tweets in Twitter, and they found that those that had the most anger and, and uh, hostility uh, had more of an increased risk of heart attacks and, and stroke than high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and all the usual risk factors. These things are really important, and we can change them. So, so hate is actually, I mean, hate is a disease in itself, right? Yeah, I mean, a, if, you, if, you, if you spew negative negativity, it actually just affects you. And there's that old saying, you know, when you point your finger at someone else, you've got three fingers pointing back at you. you yeah. know, it's, um, when you have anger towards other people, it eats you up. And yeah. So going back to, to the, the lifestyle changes. So if we get people to exercise more and to love more and to eat healthier, um, how, how, do you, how, does, how do you create sustainable change in people? Because often people are like, um, you know, I don't want to give up meat because, you know, I love my hamburger. Or, yeah. you know, I, I'm not going to get up and exercise, you know, for 20 minutes in the morning because I, I really want that extra 20 minutes of sleep. Yeah. Well, there's so many misconceptions around that. You know, am I going to, you know, the old joke, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer if I, if I eat and live healthier, you know? Uh, the only way to get to live to be 100 is by not doing all the things that would make you want to live to be 100, you know, variations on that theme. But it turns out that because these underlying biological mechanisms that we've been talking about are so dynamic, when you make lifestyle changes in the ways we're talking about, to the degree that you make them, most people find that they feel so much better so quickly in the ways that really matter most that it reframes the reason for making those changes from fear of dying or fear of something bad happening to joy and pleasure and love and feeling good, which is ultimately what makes them sustainable. There's a wonderful movie that came out, a documentary called The Game Changers, about 12 weeks ago. And it's already the most downloaded documentary in uh, Netflix history. Uh, it was done by James Cameron, who you know, did all those wonderful films like Terminator and Titanic, and, and Luis Saihoyos, who got an Academy Award for The Cove, his first documentary. And the Camerons got interested in doing this when, besides being these great filmmakers, they're also explorers. And they learned that more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. So they went on a plant-based diet, and he felt so much better, he's actually making avatars two, three, and four at the same time now, sleeping on the floor in the studio, um, just because it gives you so much thing. And the Game Changers is really about all these elite athletes who raised their game, who became Olympic medalists and mixed martial artists, national champions, and, and heavyweight boxing champions, and, and, uh, and so on, when they went on a play. In fact, the Tennessee Titans, who now look like they're going to the Super Bowl, uh, weren't even in the playoffs for 15 years until 14 of the team members went on a plant-based diet. And again, how quickly you can get better when you make these changes. So fear is not sustainable, and I think we're seeing that in the political arena now as well. What's sustainable is love and pleasure and joy and feeling good. And if what you give up, which, what you gain is more than what you give up, and because these biological mechanisms are so dynamic, you can experience these benefits very quickly. So your brain gets more blood, you think more clearly, you have more energy, you need less sleep, your skin gets more blood, you look 10 or 20 years longer. I'm, I'm 96, I think I look pretty good. <laughs> um, your heart gets more blood, you can reverse heart disease. Your sexual organs get more blood flow. There's a great scene in the Game Changers movie uh, where they give this um, these three elite athletes. Hold on, th this they're... is going to make everybody a, a, uh, a plant-based uh, <laughs> diet fan. They uh, they gave this single plant single meat-based meal to these three elite athletes in their mid 20s, and at night they measured the frequency and hardness of erections the guys had when they sleep. There's a it's a natural guy function, uh, and the next day they did the same thing, but they gave them a single plant-based meal, and it was. And then they, did, they measure the same thing. And the meat, by the way, was organic, grass-fed beef, you know, those kinds of things. And they found that the single plant-based meal, those three guys, each of them had three to 500% more frequent erections and eight to 15% harder erections after a single plant-based meal than a single meat-based meal. 
apparently the film crew went on a plant-based side after shooting this, you know. <laughs> um, but it, it illustrates so quickly that it's not about preventing something bad years down the road. I mean, that's, fear is not, you can't really sustain it. I mean, we all know we're going to die someday, but who wants to think about it, right? Um, but if you actually say, well, gosh, if I have heart disease and my chest pain goes away within a week or two in most cases, so that I can do those things that I couldn't do before. So for someone who can't walk across the street without getting pain or make love with their spouse or play with their kids or go back to work because they have so much angina or chest pain. And then we found within a few weeks they're essentially pain free and often can get off of medications they were told they'd have to take the rest of their lives under their doctor's care. They say, well, you know, I like eating cheeseburgers, but not that much because what I gain is so much more than what I give up. And yeah, I'll probably live longer, but more importantly is I'll live better and I don't have to wait long to see the benefits. So, interestingly, wh why do you think that um, this is all sort of coming to light now? Like, why, why now? What's, what's important about this time? Or yeah, yeah. It, you know? That's a really good question. I think we're at a kind of a, one of those uh, inflection points where um, there's a convergence of forces that finally make this the right idea at the right time after having been doing work for 42 years in this area. On the one hand, the limitations of drugs and surgery I mean, drugs and surgery used appropriately can be life-saving. We've all benefited from that. But they don't really address the underlying cause of why we get sick. And studies are showing, for example, that um, in the case of heart disease, that there are now more than eight randomized trials that have shown that in stable patients, stents and, and, and angioplasties just don't work. They don't prolong life. They don't prevent heart attacks. But they said, well, at least they reduce chest pain or angina. And they did a study a year ago you know, called the Orbita study where they actually Half of the patients, they put a stent in. The other half, they pretended to put a stent in. They put the catheter all the way up into their heart, didn't do anything, just pulled it out. And those people had as much a reduction in chest pain as those who actually got the stent. So apparently, the stents don't reduce angina either. And we spend billions of dollars on these interventions that are dangerous, invasive, expensive, and largely ineffective. At the same time, half of the American population today has, is, has type 2 diabetes or is, di is pre-diabetic. And yet, the studies show that getting your blood sugar down with drugs doesn't prevent the horrible complications of type 2 diabetes like blindness and, and amputations and heart attacks and strokes and impotence and so on, nearly as well as getting your blood sugar down with, 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 with diet and lifestyle. In the case of men with early stage prostate cancer, um, the studies have shown that maybe one out of 50 men who get surgery or radiation who has prostate cancer benefits from it. The other 49 are often maimed in the most personal ways in terms of being either impotent or incontinent or both for no real benefit at huge economic and huge personal costs. But if the only choice is between doing nothing and doing something, most guys are like, get this out of me, I want to be done with it. Except most guys are going to die with prostate cancer and not from it. It only becomes a life issue, life-threatening issue if it, if it spreads. And so we did the first randomized trial with Dr. Peter Carroll, who's the chair of urology at UCSF, and Dr. Bill Fair when he was chair of urology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, that these same lifestyle changes can slow, stop, and even reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer and the only side effects are good ones. We're also reaching a tipping point with, with costs of healthcare. There's all these debates in the presidential debates about should we have Medicare for all or should it be the Affordable Care Act or whatever. But the bigger question is, what are we doing to treat the underlying cause of why we get sick in the first place? And we did a, a study with um, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield in Pennsylvania where you live, and they found that after just a year of going through our program, and by the way, Medicare created a new benefit category to cover my program for reversing heart disease. And we've been working with ShareCare. They've been training hospitals and clinics around the country. And we're getting bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings, and better adherence than anyone's ever shown. And Highmark found that they caught their overall healthcare costs in half in the first year. And by 400% in the subgroup of people that they had spent at least $25,000 on in the prior year. We spent $3.6 trillion last year on healthcare, which is almost, almost exclusively sick care. And 86% of that is for treating chronic diseases that can often be prevented and even reversed through making simple lifestyle changes at a fraction of the cost. Yeah. The interesting thing, and I know we're running out of time, but uh, we, we talked a little bit about the fact that these lifestyle changes um, don't have to be done in isolation. It doesn't mean that you're abandoning um, Western medicine and Not saying like, oh, we, we don't need that. We're going to just all go for a run, eat healthier, and then we're done. Absolutely. It really is about combining everything together and yes. using the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. Well, I'm well trained as, a, as an internist, and so drugs and surgery have their place. They can be life-saving when used appropriately. The problem comes when, for example, someone with high blood pressure, or high cholesterol, or heart disease is told, 
take these uh, statins to lower your cholesterol, take these blood pressure pills, and they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? And what does the doctor usually say? Forever, right? Yep. And you know, when I lecture, I often show this cartoon of doctors busily mopping up the floor around the sink that's overflowing, like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like, forever. Well, like, why don't we turn off the faucet? Why don't we treat the cause? And what we find over and over again is that the cause, to a larger degree than what we had once thought, are these lifestyle choices that we make each day. And when people make them, to the degree they make them, they get better in ways we can measure. And they can, under their doctor's care, they can often reduce or even get off of drugs to lower their cholesterol, their blood pressure, their blood sugar that they were told they'd have to take for the rest of their lives. Which not only is, you know, you don't have the side effects and the costs of that, but empowers you, make you feel like, oh, I'm actually getting better. And so you get into this virtuous cycle rather than this downward spiral that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Well, I, th I think we're, we're out of time. I, I wanted to thank you, though, because you really have been an inspiration, both, both to me um, as I trained um, uh, to take care of patients, um, to sort of find a better way, and also to Startup Health and the Startup Health community, because you really are one of the originators of how do we bring a, get rid of chronic disease, but how do we live healthier, longer lives um, that are more fulfilling. So yes. thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you're doing. And oh. I'm, I'm just excited to see the results of the of this study and, uh, and, and move from there. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.